Welcome, everybody, all our relations. Welcome to an eco socialist seminar in memory of Joel Cobell. And uh, the special Glover Hasidic Choir Chorus Band uh, is going to welcome us. from a book called The Age of Desire. And Joel wrote, None can defeat death, but if a life is well and fully lived, its ending becomes a rounding off. The dead pass into the lives of those who remain. Like leaves falling from a tree in autumn, their passage is part of a cycle that includes the promise of renewal. Uh, just to put some things in perspective, Joel wrote a book called uh, The Lost Traveler's Dream. And uh, I'm just going to read a quote that says, uh, Brendan Puppet goes back 50 years to the time that Dee Dee and her three young boys encountered Elka Schumann and her five children on New York's Lower East Side. Many years later, the firstborns of each, Tamar and Ezra, now my stepson, having started as playmates in a sandbox in Tompkins Square Park, <laughs> now joined in a life partnership. So the Schumanns and I are family. Um, long before Dee Dee had begun associating with Peter's workshops in political street theater and after the entourage had moved to Vermont which has expanded pageant with his expanded pageantry and communitarian projects. After 1982, I came aboard and began more extensive contacts in their rural setting. I often contemplated moving there as the Green Mountain State became known as the People's Republic of Vermont. Lee Brownhill is joining us all the way from Canada. I saw Joel first on a VHS long before meeting him in person. And I always knew him as a great political actor. I mean, literally, he was an actor with great politics. <laughs> In the paper tiger role, playing both the devil and the angel. <laughs> so Joel was a great political actor. And he always grappled with big questions that embraced rather than shied away from the outrageous contradictions of our times. From the collapse of capitalism, to the reemergence of the species being, the uniting of every individual with the great history and oneness of the human species. What a joy then, years later, to meet Joel for the first time in person at, the, at a Socialist Scholars Conference in New York, not dressed in the costume of a devil or an angel, <laughs> but in the plaid and corduroy of a professor. He nonetheless invoked demons and gods with his frequent references to William Blake's illuminating critique of the early eight years of capitalism, here at the late stage of capitalism. So I jumped at the chance when he invited me to join the board of the journal, uh, Capitalism, Nature, Socialism. And that was some 10 years ago. And I've um, learned so much from Joel. As an editor-in-chief, as in everything that he put his hand to, he was a great political actor. He advanced the theory and praxis of eco-socialism decades ago and carved a path through contentious debates in his usual fashion, with humor guided by love and grounded in a sharp analytical capacity, able to defeat faulty logic in a single bound and stop speeding trains of cynicism <laughs> with his power of empathy and compassion. Yeah. The Free Life Ensemble. Um, the Lost Traveler's Dream. Maybe the best book in some way I've ever read. I knew Joel not well, but now I feel as if I know him intimately. And 
I had known that he was an intellectual and a activist. I hadn't known he was a mystic. And so um, in, in this book, I read that he loved Bach. So we are going to sing a piece by Bach that's called Sushepi Israel, lifting up Israel. But uh, Sarah, uh, Quincy's mom, has changed the words. And so now it's more Sushepi Palestine. And so to honor George, and so to honor Senate twice um, because he had been with the Green Party and I was just entering the Green Party after a terrible fight and a bit disgusted with it because we were trying to push Cynthia McKinney, a uh, long-term congresswoman who had stood so strong uh, against 9-1-1 and 9-11 that she was pushed out of, actually forced out of the Congress. Mm -hmm. So she ran for president and I came from Philadelphia back to New York where I've been in and out since 1963, uh, to coordinate Cynthia's campaign. And was very displeased with uh, the outcome of that in New York. Obviously, we had not expected Cynthia to really be the president of the United States. But it was a great move forward in terms of talking about the role of a new leadership in politics. I'm going to be at the meeting. I'm going to be at the meeting, I'm going to be at the meeting around the throne. When all the shopping is over and all this thing is done, I'm going to be at the meeting around the throne. When all the shopping is over, it's all the time is done. I'm going to be at the meeting around the throne. I want to take the liberty whenever Africans gather. We need to know that we are in the community of friends, and I know I'm in the community of friends, but I need to hear you say it. That which is required to be human. I am. I am. Because we are. Because we are. Because we are. Because we are. I am. I am. Do it one more time. I am. I am. Because we are. Because we are. Because we are. Because we are. I am. I am. Thank you. My journey began in Mississippi with a character called Medgar Wiley Evers. And of course, before it's over, I'll be through King and all of the giants. In that journey called Civil Rights and journey called the Peace Movement, we've come a long ways in the journey of building a sister's movement called the Women's Movement. We must be committed to being warrior women. We must teach our daughters to be warrior women. So we have to study every issue. We're going to have to write. We've got to do art. We've got to do drama and music. We've got to do whatever we've got to do to build the war against a system that's hell-bent on destroying planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And we, as women, are the epitome of Mother Earth. So if she's challenged, we are challenged. As we talk about environment, let us begin to redefine environment to become the space in which we live out our lives. And we'll be out here as I was in the early days, talking about I'm fighting for civil rights, da 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 da. What I was really fighting was to end the symbols of subordination that was represented in the law and put forward by the law. I was really fighting the lack of understanding on the part of whites of white supremacy. We will not accept that women are not going to be the leadership for the second half of the 21st century. So we are here, we are prepared, we are ready. And Quincy, can you take us forward? <laughs> I'm going to bring to the stage one of the founders with Joel Covell of Eco Socialist Horizons, Kanye de Almeida. I wanted to stop with a 
quote from Alice in Wonderland, just keeping with the surrealist tradition. And this, this quote occurs when Alice is talking to Tweedledum and Tweedledee. They're watching this king sleeping. And he's wearing this long nightcap with a tassel. And one of the characters, Tweedledee, says, he's dreaming now. And what do you think he's dreaming about? Alice says, nobody can guess that. Why, about you, Tweedledum exclaimed. And if he left off dreaming about you, where do you suppose you'd be? Where I am now, of course, said Alice. Not you, Tweedledee retorted. You'd be nowhere. Why, you're only a sort of thing in his dream. If that king over there was to wake, you'd go out, bang, just like a candle. And I started thinking about this as I was putting together some thoughts to share with you all. Um, and I was thinking about the lost traveler's dream, and it occurred to me that many of us here are part of that dream, the dream that Joel had. And I can't speak for everyone here, of course, but you know, we just heard from a legendary civil rights activist from Jackson, Mississippi. We have with us um, Ubuntu revolutionaries and eco-warriors from Philadelphia. You know, we have the Free Life Ensemble from, from Vermont. I myself am from Sri Lanka. And, uh, and I really feel that Joel's dream kind of brought into existence this collective that I haven't really seen exist anywhere else on this earth in terms of its diversity. Um, and I like to think of Joel, of his passing at least, as not a passing, but a falling deeper into that dream. Mm -hmm. And a, a closer weaving together of the collective that, that kind of came alive in that dream. Um, and I actually first met Joel in, in 2010 in New York City in a group of artists and activists. Um, we were called Scientific Soul Sessions. And one of the things that we were committed to doing was bringing about a new revolutionary understanding and, and practice in the world globally. And we were majority oppressed nationality members, which meant that we were black and brown and indigenous people you know, from the third and fourth worlds, however you want to define that. And one of our principles was that our collective would follow oppressed nationality leadership. And Joel, who was by far one of the most advanced thinkers and elders in that collective, was 100% down with following the leadership of young black and brown women, uh, which is not something I'd seen before in other mentors of mine, um, especially not such accomplished ones as him. And he was really ready to stand alongside people and, and, and lead and be led um, in a really collective revolutionary spirit, which, which as we all know from the history of political movements is, is not easy. So, you know, I was a journalist at this time, and one of the first conversations I had with Joel was around the World Social Forum in Dhaka, Senegal. And he was, Joel was always very excited about large gatherings of, you know, radical activists. Um, and he was thrilled, obviously, by the collective articulation of the enemy, capitalism, and its attendant horrors of neoliberal economics and neocolonial politics and their combination to create catastrophic climate change. But he was also really eager for us to collectively articulate the antidote to that poison, to that cancer. Um, and he was fearful that there was a lack of a collective articulation of a strategy forward, of saying that another world is possible, but, but not really naming that. And for him, that was eco-socialism. The seeds contained of a world system of freely associated labor that has nature at the center of its understanding and, and philosophy, you know, really leaning back centuries, as, as Kolya pointed out, into the indigenous way of life, which obviously changes our entire social relation if we take our starting point as nature and the intrinsic value of nature. That was very enlightening for me to, to really be at the center of Joel's insistence on clarity and sort of naming not only the problem, but also what the solution was. And I think for a long time that I knew him, I kind of took that, that clarity, that insistence on clarity um, for granted. Because as I said, I was working as a journalist. And I think there's a tendency in the journalistic world to kind of look for sound bites, to you know, call up your sources and be like, OK, I need three sentences on this. Let me plug that into my article. And Joel was definitely not down with that. Human Rights Watch had come out with this report about the use of violence against prisoners with psychiatric disabilities that was becoming increasingly prevalent about, across the US prison archipelago. Many of you probably know this was one of the areas that Joel studied very deeply, which was the wave of 
the institutionalization of state mental hospitals that went on across the US in the 60s and 70s, the turning out of tens of thousands of people onto the streets with no alternative housing except you know, the penal colonies and the carceral system, the rise of the psychopharmaceutical industrial complex. He introduced me to the whole world of disability justice activists and advocates who were creating their own ways and their own systems of healing that had nothing to do with the prison system. And you know, one of the things he was trying to impart to me as I was desperately trying to write this article like three months late for my editor <laughs> was that I kept looking at this kind of violence inside prisons as an aberration. I kept saying, well, you know, we're collecting all these statistics on the amount of incidents of really deadly violence against prisoners with uh, psychiatric disabilities or dangerous gifts, as they sometimes refer to them. And he, what he really wanted me to take away was that this wasn't an aberration. This was a system doing exactly what it was intended to do, which was to completely break the spirit of human beings in the, in the grand old tradition of the slave catchers and the plantation lockdowns of, of people in this country that has been going on for centuries. And, and at one point, he, um, he very kindly hired me to work with him because, as Quincy pointed out, I'm an aspiring fiction writer, so, you know, accustomed to long periods of unemployment. And <laughs> during one such, he happened to be the chair of a, a search committee at St. Mary's, uh, the Be Not Afraid Church, the St. Mary's Episcopal Church in Harlem, an amazing radical church who you'll hear from later. Um, and Joel hired me as a kind of scribe slash secretary to help them find their new pastor. And I have to admit, I went into it thinking, okay, this is really nice of Joel, maybe some slightly less alienated labor than I'm used to. And it actually turned out to be the, one of the greatest learning experiences of my life. You know, my father was really happy that I was going back into the church because he comes out of the church. And he would be like, darling, you know, how was church today? <laughs> I would say, you know, well, I learned all about the Council on Foreign Relations <laughs> and how they are the most insidious organization that continues to lend legitimacy to the U.S. empirical project, specifically in South America, but all over the world, and the U.S.'s long tradition of invading, interfering with, and destabilizing communist regimes and governments. And he was like, well, great, because he's a Marxist too. So, so that was, that, was that uh, continuity. And I, I probably learned more about US empire from Joel than I did from you know, four years of, of an undergraduate education at, at Hampshire College. Um, and, and so I just wanted to say that um, you know, being able to walk alongside this traveler, he calls himself a lost traveler, but, but really it has enabled so many other people to find another path. Um, and I, I feel like the, the forces in the world today are really, they would love nothing more than for us to be on the well-lit highway with the drones above us, police surveillance, you know, basically leading us right towards the slaughterhouse, passing all the malls and factory farms along the way. And to be lost in this world is, is truly a radical act. And in Joel losing himself, I think he created a way for us to find alternative destinies and alternative destinations that is not the slaughterhouse. And when I think of him now, I, I really love to think about the fact that he had no idea almost as he was lost in this wilderness and the muck of the world and trying to find you know, a brighter horizon. I don't even think he was aware of how many people are following in his way mm -hmm. and how many people like elders like Colia have been walking you know, parallel to him, all approaching this horizon from different destinations. And maybe we won't even know who we are until we meet on that horizon. Mm -hmm. But it was just such an honor to, to walk behind him, alongside of him, to be lost with him, so that we could you know, find ourselves in a new formation, which is eco-socialism. So thank you for letting me share those thoughts. I like to see mankind planted upon the earth, like a rock on a summit like a lighthouse on the shore. survives the gauntlet of world war and mass extinction that we're traversing through right now, people will look back and say, you know, this is one of the big, great names of the 20th century, uh, 21st century. And um, when I read The Enemy of Nature, uh, the book Joel wrote, Enemy of Nature, End of Capitalism or the End of the World, 
Um, he brings together this synthesis of Marxism and spiritual traditions and uh, you know, respect and reverence for indigenous peoples and bringing it into a new theory of value, um, Marxist value theory with you have use value, exchange value, but you also have intrinsic value of nature. Um, this is like a paradigm shifting uh, breakthrough, I think, for humanity. He persuaded me and I, I basically left behind my, my sort of uh, labor, youth, labor movement organizing job and we embarked on this crazy idea of founding an organization in the United States to build eco-socialism here and to connect with movements in the global south, primarily Africa, Asia, and Latin America, where there are mass movements with people using this word. It was, we were grappling with that how. Um, how do we overcome capital? And uh, we, we came to some conclusions, and we moved on those conclusions. And um, in 2012, we had this gathering in Vermont and founded an organization. And in 2013, totally not related to anything that we were doing, um, in a very unlikely place, uh, an oil country called Venezuela um, declared itself, the it was the first government in the world to put, to put out a five-year plan to, to create, to dedicate itself to create an eco-socialist mode of production. And this is, there's a multi-year process here, but, uh, and I know I, this, this is not the place to do a whole, I have to do a, sort of one of these Joel Covell digress, digressions where I sh <laughs> scratch my head and have a little tantrum about the U.S. imperial media, which makes it almost impossible to have a conversation about Venezuela because almost all the categories and words we've heard about it are so far out of reality. Um, but just suffice to say that um, as, of, as of now, as, as of about five or five years ago, there are tens of thousands of people in Venezuela in the process of building eco-socialist communes, explicitly in those terms. And um, to give one example of the work that they've accomplished in 2015, uh, there was this big process, multi-year process, organizing people by bioregion that culminated in a big march to Caracas, and they succeeded in passing the first and I believe only anti-GMO, anti-patent seed law in the world. Ooh. And it's written by farmers. And it's not only anti-GMO, it's also anti-patent, which is like even more radical. And so throughout this process, you know, I would come back from these trips and tell Joel about it and, you know, witness how people from all over Latin America were coming to Venezuela, people from Argentina, from Paraguay, all the radicals from around there coming there even if they don't agree with everything the government is doing, there's more space there than anywhere else in Latin America right now to do radical revolutionary organizing. You don't have to be underground. And, um, and you know, Joel and I were talking about this and, you know, and we were considering we had been in Durban, South Africa uh, previously and we had had this idea that, you know, what we, what's really needed right now is, is some sort of, something more than naming the problem as Kanye was mentioning something more than uh, saying another world is possible. We have to name that world. And there was something that, that Joel had put in in the first eco-socialist eco manifesto, which is he put it in the form of a question, is could we imagine an eco-socialist international? Um, and this goes back to those days of those guys Colia talked about, of the Lenin and those guys who founded Marx, who founded an international association of the workers of the world. And so the idea of an eco-socialist international started percolating, and we were thinking about this, and Joel and I wrote a few letters. Joel wrote it mostly, I would translate it, and we would send them, um, you know, to, we sent them to some people in government, we sent them to some grassroots people, and we were like, you know, you guys really have the capacity right now to convoke and launch an, an eco-socialist international. And it's a multi-year process, and other people came on board, and we found other people who'd already been working on it, um, and jump ahead, uh, 2016, we had a big international preparatory gathering, and then in 2017, last year in November, about 100 delegates from five different continents, about 19 countries, came together in a maroon, three different maroon communities in northwestern Venezuela, and we deliberated for three days, and we wrote this document, and we agreed at the end to, we, we, we eventually came to agreement um, and founded the first eco-socialist international. I think that this is a hugely, hugely important development for the whole world. And I've realized that, you know, it's been a couple generations since an international played a role in people's lives. You sort of have to do the history lesson of what is this stuff. But this is a mostly very educated and, and elder crowd, so everybody knows what an international is here. Um, I think in some ways, maybe the most important page of this is the last page. Um, I have copies of this, too. Come and, come and get it when you're done and all the organizations that participated in this. And I had personally never seen anything like it before, and it's testament to the, the, the 
techniques and uh, of facilitating grassroots democracy that these Venezuelan activists have been working on for years of getting 100 people to collectively write a document together. And we broke up into five groups, um, which were the five elements, um, earth, air, water, fire, spirit, and or ether. And then each group made the idea was uh, to make a plan for the short, medium, and long term, right? Because it took us generations to get into this mess. It's going to take us generations to get out. And then we all came together, and everything was read out in assembly for anybody. If anybody had an objection, you could change it. It's an arduous but beautiful process. Um, so the result is a 500-year plan uh, for the salvation of Mother Earth. Oh. And, uh, yeah. Joel meant something really specific. When he talked about um, the intrinsic value of nature, he was, really, he was open to a spiritual, mystical dimension that many socialists and Marxists are not. He was also open to a profound, he talks in his memoir about his experience um, with the, meeting the Maroons in Suriname as a, uh, as a medical student and how this really impacted him. It was the first time he'd seen another way of life. Um, and it was that kind of thing that made it sort of possible in a lot of people's minds, at least for me, to say, you know what, maybe it's these maroon communities in Vene that everybody's kind of forgotten about in the modern world are actually, this is the best place in the world to, to take the, the step, a leap forward. Um, that this is the fulfillment of this maroon indigenous legacy is to be host to this, to this vast international uh, conglomeration of activists from all, all these realms. Um, so I think Joel really put together a lot of these pieces diligently at his desk. He was sitting there with all these books quietly um, and working on this thing. And nobody cared when he was running around shouting and going to the next rally. And he would go to the rally too, but then he would come back to his desk and take his time to fine tune the theory. And that um, there's a quote from uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra um, where he says, you know, that the, uh, the, 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 uh, the world revolves quietly um, around the creators of new values, that the great events are not the noisiest hours, they are the stillest hours. And Joel and his stillest, stillest hours of scholarship and thinking created a groundwork for a world to revolve around. At the same time, you know, all the, all the what you're saying is giving a lot of hope, but I think that we have to, to also to point out what all the aggressivity against uh, against uh, uh, Venezuela come from all, uh, you know, the, all, all, what, all what is happening over there. Yeah. That's why there is all this aggressivity against right. uh, Venezuela. And also, I read that in 2017, almost 200 people, activists uh, from the ECO movement, uh, there is Berta Caceres that a lot of people know, but in Philippines, in uh, Colombia, in uh, so many places, you know, people working against the uh, uh, oil companies, all, all these things, you know, died. Today, people working in eco movement are becoming the targets of the system. And I think this is important also to say because Amnesty International made a list of almost 200 people only in 2017, you know. So this is good, you know, to speak about the hope, but also the danger of the of the system who become more and more aggressive. Uh, with a lot of yeah. okay. Thank, thank you, thank you. Uh, and Julia says earlier, prepare for war, and because it's already here. That's it. Um, yeah. Syria is the future. I mean, that's the World War Three already started over there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's going to come home. And the degree to which we're going to get through it is the degree to which we're prepared. And I, I think that this can help. I think that Joel can help. And sometimes it's not the flashy thing out front that needs to be done. It's the quiet thing. Radical theologian, uh, liberation theologist, extraordinaire, Earl Cooper Camp. Yeah. Oh, we haven't been silent. I heard a hell of a lot of words today. We've been saying a lot, and it's been uh, really good. So I'm going to say a few more words, because I'm a preacher, and that's what we do. Um, <laughs> But, but as I was thinking, uh, coming here, uh, you know, a, a very wise woman, Anne Lamont, a writer, uh, uh, writes, uh, in Christian faith, death is just a major change of address. <laughs> and uh, with that major change of address, I have a hard time uh, since uh, uh, when Joel died, uh, 
you know, really talking about him in the past tense because I really feel that spirit uh, is still here with us. And so I want to say that uh, Joel is a revolutionary mystic. That's what he really taught me, being a revolutionary mystic. I first uh, met Joel Covell back in the late 70s uh, in his book, uh, White Racism. And uh, for a, a young man who'd grown up uh, down in Jim Crow uh, in Kentucky, uh, that was just literally uh, talking about a revolution. It just, uh, like uh, Brother Gandhi said, uh, the brain cells exploded. They were just all over the place. Because um, it really uh, began getting into the nature of what white supremacy was about and uh, the real need to begin to fight that on all fronts and how to turn that over, that revolution that has to happen uh, mm -hmm. around the, the uh, white supremacist uh, history of this nation and uh, throughout the world and all the other things that that, uh, that caused. Also, uh, then, it was uh, later on when I actually, uh, in that uh, wonderfully uh, incarnational way that we have in Christian faith, I actually met Joel in the flesh when he came, uh, uh, came to St. Mary's Church uh, at the invitation of one of our members, Jim White, who just finished uh, Enemy of Nature, uh, was having a little bit of a tussle with the authorities at uh, Bard College, and uh, so uh, began looking for some new ways, and uh, heard about this little uh, church in West Harlem uh, where he's invited to, to begin talking to us about eco-socialism. And it really, uh, I have to say, that's where there was a whole nother uh, revolution for me. That eco part of it, the oikos, the household, it's about coming home. It's about living in our home. And it's about how we are home together. Those relationships that we have with each other, establishing our home and making sure we take care of what that home is. Uh, and Joe could do that in that wonderful uh, long run, uh, a vision that still is with us all today. Even, uh, even in death, that spirit could be so present for uh, each one of us. Joel, with that uh, untiring curiosity that he had, that incredible, uh, uh, indomitable, uh, analytic uh, mind that was always uh, putting together this great synthesis, he arrived at what eco-socialism was, I think, very much intellectually, but his heart, indeed his soul, I think he arrived at it right in this sacred space. Because this was a sacred space for him. For Joel, this was coming to church even before he set foot at St. Mary's. This was really coming to church. Uh, that uh, the, the, the cathedral aspect of uh, all that goes on here, the creative aspects uh, uh, continued to feed his spirit. But I think it touched his soul in a way that he knew that indeed what we were doing, uh, the path that we collectively were going down was so wrong that this began to show him the possibilities and what needed to be embodied in all of our lives, in all of our spirits, bringing that revolutionary mysticism together. And that's why this is such a sacred space and this is such a sacred time, out of time, as we come together to do this. That place beyond words where he could touch the eternal, touch that spirit that was so deep. And I... I he never could quite put it into words. Even Joel <laughs> Covell couldn't put it into words. <laughs>
all for that. Right. That was profoundly moving. My name is Molly. I'm Joel's daughter, younger, youngest daughter, and um, my s other siblings, uh, except for Ezra, who's there, um, are not able to be here, but they are all immensely grateful that this ceremony was able to happen and, and that the pine forest can be a place for the memory of our father. This really was very hallowed ground for him in, in the most profound way. There couldn't be any more fitting place and tribute to him than this spot. And um, this book, which was made by my brother, Toby, um, he's a blacksmith. He lives in Delaware County, New York. And uh, he forged this with some assistance um, out of some sheets of steel. And it is entirely forged. There's, it's all folded steel. There's no welds at all. So everything that you see there was just a flat piece of steel and he uh, and, a, and a long piece of pipe, steel, you know, steel flat and then a rod, I guess, of steel. And it was all made in um, <clears throat> a coal forge. Uh, by hand with hammers. <laughs> and if you put your hand on it, you can smell the coal. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to rust. It's going to have a nice patina. Probably this time next year it will be all uh, red and orange. If any of you are familiar with Richard Serra's sculptures, it will look a little bit like that. And then we'll plan to kind of oil it to stop the rusting process um, at that point. And you should read the book, Molly, right? Everybody should read the book read because book. it would say everything you wanted to say. <laughs> Can I offer a song? That would be great. We give thanks to the breeze which carries the spirit of the ancestors. We come to give thanks to the ancestors. It has a reverberating effect and it's singing to everyone's ancestors. Maybe this is a good time to talk about Joel's movie career. <laughs> Joel performs a stellar, he delivers a stellar performance in my all-time favorite movie, Born in Flames, in which he plays um, a, a, a conservative right-wing pundit who is um, opining about these revolutionary women. And he plays the role with such zest and glee and like that. Like every time I watch that film, I, I revisit it from time to time because it's my favorite movie. And every time I come to Joel, I find myself clenching my hands like this and l watching, leaning in towards the screen with a little grin in my face. And every time I see him, he was a fantastic movie star. Um, he was in another movie called Sigmund Freud's Dora, in which he plays Freud with a very big cigar. And, and it's a very f famous case, the Dora case, in which Freud probably made quite a few mistakes. And uh, Joel doesn't let on, but it's, um, it's a critical film made by a, a, a collective, feminist collective in the early, in the mid 80s, I think. And uh, I don't know if it's online, but it should be. <laughs> Sigmund Freud's Dora. Oh. I'd like to throw in a couple of comments about Joel's um, running for office. Uh, I'd like to somebody who knows more about that than I do. What I remember is that he came up here while he was in campaigning, and he did a puppet show of his campaign. With Mark. Um, with, with Mark. Mark Aspen. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was in a little sideshow. Yeah. Uh, 
with with Joel uh, giving his uh, campaign speech, and you know I was the, the chorus of uh, the uh, questioners, and I always remember that was such a great way to run a campaign. <laughs> he didn't win. <laughs> Maybe because he was running for New York State or New York Senate, and this is not New York. No, In the Green Party. <laughs> Um, I'd just like to say a few words about Joel's book, the last, his last book, Memoirs of a Lost Traveler. Yes. And it is, it has a beautiful cover of a toddler, four-year-old Joel, that his father made or yes. and yes. painted of him. And it's his life story. He's such a good writer and it works so well on many levels, his different beliefs that he going from Orthodox Jewish to, to a very passionate anti-Zionist to then ending up a Christian, but many stages in between and all his involvement in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and all that. And it's very intense and lively, beautifully written. We have a few copies left in the museum store and some will be gladly loan out, copy out to whoever wants to read it because it's really worth, when I was reading it, it was as though he was alive right next to me. It was so vivid. Yeah, I want to second that. I read the book and just before I go to sleep so I could only read like a few pages, but I felt like he was with me yeah. for quite some time every night. It was really beautiful. And I also want to say that there was one point where some Palestinian women came and he had a circle and a big discussion with these women who said, this is the first time we've ever felt okay about Jews because we've only had Israelis at checkpoints and we hated them and they were horrible. And I just remember this incredible warmth that he brought to this circle, which second, I can't remember, if, Peter, if you did your show first about Rachel Corey? Mm -hmm. And then he had this circle of people upstairs in the ballroom, mm -hmm. and it was quite, it was really touching, very powerful. Joel came for, I don't know, a decade mm -hmm. and faithfully performed in circuses and pageants. And in editing the Ah movie, there were many shots of a figure kind of wandering off from the group. <laughs> <Yes. so laughs> puppet. Obviously, it was very difficult, like a, a house with a puppet inside of it. And that had to move like from here all the way across the field. And there'd be this one wandering off. And then you'd hear Peter yell, Shot! Joel he describes um, working at Bread and Puppet and all the creative things and the, all the little visionary stuff. And the biggest part of the, of the longest section is about moving outhouses. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it goes right down to the practical. Yeah. Number one volunteer job that everybody wanted. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> <laughs> I remember he was in the play. But it was about the, um, the, the massacre in Connecticut, on the Connecticut River. Pequod. Pequod, Pequod massacre. Who else was in that? You mean Puppet the Thanksgiving show? show way back in the Brooklyn? The toy theater show? No, no, no. no. It was a side show. A side show. Was done. I think it was but a... he was so... He had no idea about it. And it really influenced. So he, laid, he later wrote a book about, um, about the... Um, uh, about anti-communism, and the book yeah, starts yeah. with about anti-communism being the prime mover of the massacre of Indians that they just didn't understand about private property, and uh, that, that was the one thing about Indians that 
that all the Puritans uh, hated the most. <laughs> This afternoon, when mo all of you were, most of you were in re the rehearsal in the ballroom, there were such <coughs> excellent speakers who talked about Joel and his the different connections and the different influences he had on his life. And I wish some of them would maybe give a short summary. I think that was meant to happen right now. Um, Can you tell the goose story again? Want to hear it again? Yes. 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 <laughs> I was in prison for 30 years, since the age of 15. And I was released eight months ago. And um, during my time in prison, I ran across these words. Um, it was in one prison that I ran across them, 2003. And they were powerful then, but it wasn't until I got transferred to another prison called Greater Ford that these words became so powerful and profound for me because these creatures lived in that prison called Canadian Geese. And um, they shared that space with us. Actually, they weren't trying to share the space with us. <laughs> uh, again, it was an antagonistic relationship. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, it was... But again, it was their space before the prison was built mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Right? And it wasn't until I started reading Joel Covell's books, well, his one book, Enemy of Nature, and where he was talking about um, dominative splitting, you know, separating um, ourselves from the rest of nature, the estrangement of ourselves from nature, and so on and so forth, that these words really, the, the, the gravity of them really started to settle on them. And it's five lessons from the geese. And the first lesson is this. Fact one, as each goose flaps its wings, it creates an uplift for the birds that follow. <laughs> By flying in a V formation, the whole flock adds 71% greater flying range than if each bird flew alone. The lesson, people who share a common direction and sense of community can get where they're going quicker and easier because they're traveling on the thrust of one another. Fact two. When a goose falls out of formation, it suddenly feels the drag and resistance of flying alone. It quickly moves back into the formation to take advantage of the lifting power of the bird immediately in front of it. The lesson, if we have as much sense as a goose, we stay in formation with those heading where we want to go, we're willing to accept their help, and offer our help to others. Fact three, when the lead goose tires, it rotates to the back of the formation and another goose flies to the point position. The lesson, it pays to take turns doing the hard tasks and sharing leadership. As with geese, people are interdependent on each other's skills, capabilities, and unique arrangements of gifts, talents, and resources. Fact four, the geese flying in formation honk, 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 we hear them, to encourage those up front to keep up their speed. The lesson, we need to make sure our honking is encouraging. <laughs> in groups where there is encouragement, productivity is much greater. The power of encouragement, that is to stand by one's own heart and core values and encourage the heart and core values of others, is the quality of honking we seek. And fact five. When a goose gets sick, wounded, or shot down. Two geese drop out of formation and follow it down to help and protect it. Who knew that? Right? They stay with it until it dies or is able to fly again, 
Then they launch out with another formation or catch up with, your, with the larger flock. The lesson, if we have as much sense as geese, we stand by each other in difficult times as well as when we are strong, right? So we'll probably, hopefully, never look at Canadian geese the same again, <laughs> right? Respect these creatures because again, even when we were behind prison walls at Greater Ford where the walls were like almost as tall as these trees, where we couldn't even see trees and we were cut off from nature, we still were given something by nature to show us, you know, what it is to, to, to work together, to build a community, to keep families together, teams, run organizations, and just do what it takes to save our communities, save our family, right? Save our world. Because we can't do it without each other. And we are each other's only yes. hope. And I think if we look deeply enough in Joel Covell's work, we'll see that those, those seeds chopped in there. That that's the message. And it's Joel's energy, you know, life, every life is an energy. And Joel's energy is producing this in this moment, us coming right. together. You know, and this is the example. So can the Honk Festival live up to the <laughs> I don't remember which year we celebrated the anniversary of Marx, young Marx's early notebooks, which he wrote in Paris when he was 24 years old. And Joel was here and gave Karl Marx classes. Do you remember that? Pretty amazing. Yep. Oh, he had an intense knowledge of these greatest writings of Marx. He's very young, right? just after he got married, when he moved to Paris, with his young wife, and he wrote these notebooks, amazing. Uh, we have little, we made little postcards of a lot of the slogans, reflections on work and label and, uh, and we did the Marx money nativity. and so forth. And we did a uh, Karl Marx nativity. <laughs> <laughs> Start crucifying him. <laughs> and Mark and Joel wore a Marx mask and had an argument with Mr. Schwartz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think my first year here was around the time, it must have been the same year that The Enemy of Nature came out, the book. And I arrived here and we all read the book and the book provided so much text for so many shows for a long time. And then I remember the company toured in that bus, which is now retired in Germantown. And that bus like fell apart and then it, you know, it had to be retired because it was not good in any way, and that bus is actually called the Enemy of Nature bus. <laughs> <laughs> it was just such a big, that book was such a big part of being here for me for my whole first few years. I think it's still leaking oil. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could do a, a brief humorous reading from the memoir about uh, the outhouse detail at Fred and Puppet. <laughs> After all, what is to happen with the bread and aioli? <laughs> Eventually, Michael Dennison became, so to speak, the foreman of the outhouse crew, seeing to it that these structures were built, maintained, rehabilitated, and cleaned as needed. He would announce whatever had to be done at the morning meeting where tasks for the day were allocated, and then meet with the volunteers later on. Now. If we were to take a kind of straw poll here, I warrant that the average person would foresee difficulties in recruiting sufficient numbers of workers for Denison's task, given the widely recognized fact that latrine duty is pretty much the, the nadir as so far as the social hierarchy of labor goes. That's what the untouchables are for, inasmuch as cleaning up excrement pretty much defines the bottom of society's pyramid of value. Important philosophical glosses indirect 
Important philosophical glosses direct indirectly surround this principle. For example, the notable Marxist Hegelian dictum that the realm of freedom begins where the realm of necessity ends. <laughs> there being little that more combines necessity, displeasure, and unfreedom in everyday life than dealing with piss and shit. <laughs> and who has not heard or even said so him or herself that the reason socialism or communism would not work is that we are always going to need lesser kinds of people to do lesser kinds of work like cleaning latrines so that the higher people could do higher things. How strange then that Bread and Puppet would draw to itself such bizarre folk as would actually want to do Michael's outhouse duty and think of it as a kind of privilege. For they, which to be sure included myself, would volunteer in droves to clean out the waste pits. We didn't just go to clean up, however, but to do so in the presence of others, a presence livened by jokes, laughter, and often enough singing. It was another example of the truth that production is first of all a matter of social relations. Mm that we puppeteers went gladly to do jobs considered onerous by a repressive society had to do with the fact that this was freely associated labor mm. outside the money circuits that comprise capital's brain non-hierarchical except for michael's benign delegated organizing and collectively carried out <laughs> under such circumstances a transvaluation occurs lightening the weight of civilization and its repression of na repression of nature and the body excrements included the release of which nature provides is highly pleasurable for all the disgust it provokes in so many. <laughs> it all came down to the quality of the labor as expressed through the relations among those who exercised it. The power of this was shown one summer when compelling obligations forced Denison to be unable to take part in the actual theatrical events, but he would not be kept away. Rather, hopping into his car for a 200-mile drive from Glo to Glover from Maine, arriving just in time to assume the leadership of the outhouse brigade, <laughs> helping to get things ready for the performance, and leaving when he achieved his goal. <laughs> it all cut very deep, these lowly matters, deep and far back into our lives. And down the rain doth pour, the ocean it doth roar, against the shore, all to praise in their lays. That God that ne'er declines his designs. Through all the world is made, the forest and the clay. Nor let me be afraid, though I dwell on the hill since nature's works declare